before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. Today, we're going to be looking even deeper into the legend, the conspiracy around Louis Charles, the lost Dauphin of France, the son of Marie Antoinette, and Louis the Sixteenth, who, according to legend in conspiracy, survived his fate. We are going through the book of Daniel which is a book written by a man named Stephen Pesor, who is, as legend states, is a descendant of Louis Charles, who ended up coming to the America, the New World, post-American Revolution, under the name Daniel Pesor. So last week, if you joined us, I will place that video down in the description box below. Don't worry, you don't have to watch it first. I will give a recap before we get into this next section. But last week, as I was going through this book, I, as I told you guys, I realized that this book is self-published, which is not a problem at all. I think it's great when anybody is willing to share their information in a big way. But it's also really, not only is it just self-published, I don't even think that this book is necessarily, the intention of it is to necessarily even tell a story. I think what, as, as I thought about this more, I think what Stephen is doing, a descendant of this guy, is basically putting together all of his research into his own family and then handing it over to you. And so I can respect that. And so what I've done, as I told you guys I was going to do last week, is I've gone ahead and I've read ahead. And I've taken his research and I've done my own research on top of it. And, you know, this is what I tell you guys to do with my stuff all the time. So I got to practice what I preach. Like whenever I put a deep dive out, I want you guys not to take my word for it. I want you to take that information and research it for yourself. You know, for many years now, in the last few years, we are very well aware that the mainstream media is not always honest. I think you would be pretty naive at this point to think that they're telling you the truth. Now, we learned that, and we learned that whatever the media puts out, we then need to go research for ourselves because we're probably not getting the truth from them. However, it's, it's, it drives me crazy because I see people who know that about mainstream media, but yet they hold a different standard to the quote unquote truther community or disclosure community where whatever a truther tells them, they take as fact without researching that, which, you know, both are lying to you, like both are lying to you. And so what I think we, we need to take our power back. We have to look deeper into this. And so that's what I did. I'm enjoying this because I love a good conspiracy. I love a good legend and I love a good scandal. Again, I don't, I don't really have an opinion on whether Louis Charles is Daniel or not yet. Um, it, to me, in, in my train of thought, it doesn't even really matter because if this particular family is puppeting the world, like legend states doesn't really matter who they're descended from yeah Does that makes sense but it's still interesting nonetheless now also with that being said i feel like i need to clarify this on most of my videos on this channel so if you're new to this channel we are very well aware of tartaria for example i am very well aware of an alternative timeline i've done a lot of shows about it it's very intriguing to me but we don't know what the truth is, right? And so when we're looking at work like this, I am going to be going off of the mainstream narrative, the historical narrative that we are taught in school. I've said before that people have asked the Cassiopeians, which is a board that I follow. They've been channeled for 30 years and yet to be wrong. Um, 
what our history is like. And basically they kind of, and I'm paraphrasing, please go and research the Cassiopeians for yourself. They basically have said they're both right, both Tartaria and the mainstream narrative that there's about a thousand years we have missing. And so what we think took, took expanded over 2000 years only actually happened in a thousand years. So regardless, we don't really know what the truth is about our own history. And so I think it's important that even when we have the Tartarian narrative coming into our cultural psyche, that we also continue to look at the official narrative too, just so we don't get lost amongst all the, you know, we, we got to keep our minds open to multiple possibilities. But again, with this work more specifically, we are simply going to be working off of the historical documentation. It's irrelevant to pull in Tartaria into this because if the Tartarian timeline is true, then around this time, historically, would have been the mud floods anyway. And so I'm just going to leave the mud floods and Tartaria on the side for now as we look through what Stephen's research actually is. Now, moving forward, chapter four, chapter five, and chapter six are all different historical people that are very important to American history. And so the first chapter four, who we're going to talk about today, is a man named Peter Stewart Ney. And this is actually a man that I never heard of, so I thought it was super interesting to research him. The next chapter is over a guy named Jean Lafayette. Now, for the Americans, especially those from the Southeast, you know who Jean Lafayette was. He was, well, he was a pirate, right? We, For people who are not from the United States, we got a lot of pirates. We had a lot of pirates down here in the Southeast. Blackbeard went all up and down the Southeast. I'll tell you guys a story quickly about Blackbeard because I know people know that name where my mother is from in Charleston, South Carolina, there is a, for a long time, there were the, those old buildings, all the buildings are super old. And they, the city had made this building into condos, right? It was an old house that got turned into condos. And the story goes that people would move out of the, these condos really quickly. They move in and they'd move out. And they claimed that at night they would hear a, like all night, like underground, just this like banging all night and they couldn't sleep. And what it was basically, so Blackbeard, who went up and down the East Coast of the United States, whenever he would go to bury treasure, he would take his his crew, his other pirates with him, and they would dig and bury the treasure, but then he would unalive the other pirates and leave them down there so that nobody could tell the secret of where his treasure was. And so what people believe it, the, that the tenants were hearing were the other pirates that have been unalive digging the hole to put the treasure in. So we've got a lot of these stories down in the Southeast. So Jean Lafayette was also another pirate. We also have the Marquis de Lafayette, which is uh, chapter six. Most American history kids or American kids know the name the Marquis de Lafayette because he was a French citizen that was huge, a huge help in the American Revolution. So these are three separate people and their stories are gonna intertwine with Daniel Pesor. However, I'm gonna, I wanna look at them separately because even though they they intertwine together i think it's important kind of like what we're doing with the borgias it's important to look at them as individuals as well because that's where we start to get a more um a, a more broader view of, of what the story is what the conspiracy really is now there's a couple things i want to note before we get into especially peter stewart nay now with this guy he allegedly and we're going to get into stevens or excuse me, Peter Stewart Nay, I don't know if I said Peter Stewart Nay. With the Peter Stewart Nay story, we are going to get into um, a conspiracy that he was actually somebody else from France. Now, I was looking through, when I was looking through the research over this and the contemplation over this particular conspiracy, a lot of things I read in reports were like, well, this is ridiculous because the Southeast notoriously was an English colony. So why, you know, the fact that this French guy was here, and I just laughed at that because that's a very ignorant perspective to take. And I've spoken about this before especially regarding like my own family, a lot of families that are from the Southeast. Yes, the Southeastern part, for those who are not aware of this, or if you're from another country, this does heavily play into our story here. So bear with me as I talk about the historical settlements of the Southeast. So when we're looking at the original 13 colonies, that's basically the Eastern border of the United States, excluding Florida. So we have this border and you can see more specifically within the eastern seaboard, seacoast, 
where particular settlements happened. So where there's a lot of Italian people of Italian heritage or where there's a lot of English people, so forth and so forth. And yes, the Southeast was predominantly English settlements. Georgia, where I live, was, according to the official narrative, was named after King George. Um, the Carolinas, Virginia, like, these are all English names. And yes, New Orleans, the port at New Orleans in Mobile, Alabama, that whole area in the Gulf, was French. Now, for a long time, it, it went back and forth between France and Spain. And I have a whole New Orleans playlist that I will link down below if you're interested in this type of history. Now, Louisiana, the Louisiana Purchase happened at the beginning of the 1800s, the beginning of the 19th century, where Napoleon actually sold the territory of Louisiana to the newly formed United States. Now, when I say the territory of Louisiana, I'm not talking about the little state. It was a huge territory at that time. So before the 1800s, this was not even a part, like Louisiana wasn't even a part of the colonies. Now, what does is, what is one have to do with the other? So when you have, according to the official narrative, when you had a bunch of Europeans moving over to the new worlds, the newfound land, um, what they were typically doing for a lot of them was they were running from religious persecution, which we can see why. Again, we're covering the Borgias. There was huge turmoil in Europe. Um, the, the, the Borgias were kind of the precursor to the Protestant Reformation. And we talk about turmoil. We're talking about wars. We're talking about people losing their life in horrific ways for basically like choosing a different flavor of Christianity. You know, you had the Calvinists, you had the Lutheran, well, the Luth Lutherans, you had the Presbyterians, you had all these different Protestant beliefs. They're all under the umbrella of Protestantism popping up in Europe. Now, even in France, more specifically, since we're talking about people of French lineage, you had what was called the War of Religions. We, again, we covered this a little bit with Catherine de' Medici. I'll put that down in the description box below. We covered this with Henri IV. Again, I'll put that in the description box below. This was a huge, huge, very traumatic, very violent, many years of battles between Catholicism the people who supported the Vatican and these newfound ideas and theories over Christianity. Now, when we look at the French, I have a lot of French in heritage on both sides of my family. When we're looking at French settlement in the Southeast, even though the Southeast was a English colony, it was very English in its culture. We have a lot of French people as well and Germans. Why? Because we have French people coming in to the English colony looking for religious protection. They're looking for religious protection. So what does this mean? That means that most of the French people who settled in the southeastern United States were Huguenots, which are French Protestants. All right. Um, there are still Huguenot churches in Charleston to this day in South Carolina. And so what we see with a lot of the French settlers who came into the southeast, not only were they coming into English, an English colony for religious protection, but they also very quickly tried to adapt to English culture for said protection. Right. So they didn't mind paying taxes to the English crown, as long as they were protected and they could live their life peacefully and, and worship whatever religion they wanted to. And at that point, if you guys know your history, according to the mainstream narrative, Henry Tudor, King Henry VIII, in the 1500s was the man who pulled England away from the Catholic Church because he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn, and that's thus set up the Church of England, which we call uh, the Episcopalian Church, which is kind of like Catholic Junior, but they don't recognize the Pope. And so by these uh, French and German people immigrating, choosing to immigrate to an English colony, again, that is what they're looking for. They were looking for religious protection from Catholicism from the brutality of what's happening um, in their home country. I talked about, I have on my dad's side of the family, the Bennets. Uh, my, my grandmother was a Bennett. It's spelled Benet though. They actually did come up through New Orleans, the Benets, and they very quickly, 
very quickly got in their horse and buggies and hightailed it for, for the English colonies. And they adapted very quickly, adapted. They changed the way that their name was said from Benet to Bennett. So it sounded more English for their own protection, but they never changed the spelling. So the spelling is still very French. Um, and they started naming their children with very English names, again, to try to merge into this culture for protection. The Bryces, my name, Bryce is my mother's name, maiden name. Now, typically, Bryce is spelled B-R-Y-C-E. It's Scottish. However, B-R-I-C-E is French. It's Bryce. But when the Bryces came in to the Southeast for protection, they very quickly, like the Bennets, adapted the English way of saying their last name, again, for their own protection. Okay, I have my mom's side too. I have German line, that's the same thing. They very quickly came in and very quickly tried to adapt to English culture in order to protect themselves. So I, with that being said, for all of you guys who think that the, the conspiracy uh, regarding Peter Stuart Ney being false because he was French in an English colony is absolutely very ignorant. I mean, if you go to Charleston City itself, you're going to see like Ravenel Bridge. Like there's so many French names, family names in Charleston alone. There's even a French quarter, a smaller French quarter. It's not like New Orleans, very tiny, but there's so much French heritage there. And it's specifically, again, because they were Huguenots. So when we talk about these French people and their prominence in the Southeast, Again, this was not strange. So the conspiracy between these people or with these people all have to, to revolve around Daniel Pesor, who allegedly was Louis Charles. However, the fact that they were French is not, it, that's not going to bat an eye at this point in history because there are so many French people in this area that are literally just trying to live a better life, just like the English people who came here. They're, they're looking for, for a better life, right? So that is kind of a mute point. Like that... That argument to me, it just doesn't, there's just no argument, right? It, it, it doesn't matter. Now, okay, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, I hope that makes sense. If you have any more questions about that, please feel free to ask me or better yet, just do your own research. And again, once again, for the people in the back who didn't hear me in saying this, I'm completely negating the Tartarian mud flood conspiracy. All right, we're not looking at that with this story. We're looking at what we have, but we acknowledge that this could be the true timeline We'll see. It's we'll let it, we each have to let it play out, right? Now, to recap what we talked about, like how did we get here? The road so far, right? How did we get here? So again, this is about this whole, the whole subject of this book, of this research, revolves around a man named Daniel Pesor. And I'm going to be very careful. I might say his name more this episode than I did the last episode, but you might hear me interchange his last name with the P family because this last name does trigger the powers that be. So I'm trying to be very careful with how many times I say that name. Now, the argument is not the existence of this person. We have historical records that this person did exist. He was a man living in North Carolina in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, we know his descendants are here today. But again, we don't know for sure whether this man, Daniel, was legitimately a man named Daniel who was born to this particular family or as the conspiracy states, the legend states that he was actually Louis Charles, the um, son of Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI after they lost their lives during the French Revolution. Again, my opinion doesn't matter. All that matters is, is there is if there is a family that's pulling the strings behind the scenes, that's controlling our world we need to know about it regardless of where they descend from i also again want to reiterate that in my opinion it does not matter what somebody's last name is it does not matter the family that they come from there can be plenty of people out there that come from these establishment families that are really good people and so we cannot judge an individual person just based on their last name or based on the sins of their family. We need to be very careful about that and really treat every human being as a separate entity with their own free will choice. So in saying that as well, it doesn't mean that Louis Charles, if he was kidnapped, did anything wrong in his life. We, we don't are any, you know, created any crimes against humanity or anything like that. We, we don't know, right? That's just something. And so we have to keep this kind of in the realm of speculation. Yeah, I mean, he's not alive now, so it doesn't really matter. But we just want to make sure as human beings that we are treating every person with um, fairness 
as we would want to be treated. We all we all got shenanigans in our family line. We all got people in our family nine, line that were shady. So so you know you know let's be kind to each other and treat each other with a little bit of grace and mercy. So we started off with the French Revolution, basically, which again, as I said last week, and as I say every time we talk about the French Revolution, the French Revolution it was savage. Right. It was savage. They that was the invention of the guillotine. You know, they literally were vigilante. And so they had arrested Marie Antoinette, who was a Habsburg and Louis the 16th, the people and imprisoned them during the French Revolution. They also imprisoned their children. At this time, there were only two children. The other children that they had 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 passed away prior to this of sickness. So a daughter named Maria Teresa and a son named Louis Charles. Maria Teresa was the oldest. And then Louis Charles was around the age of eight when he was taken into um, prison, basically. So in fairness to the French people, even though the children, you know, looking back at what people did to the children at this time, you know, you can take a child into captivity for their own protection or because of who their family is without actually putting them in prison. I mean, the kid was eight, right? He was eight years old. He was a child. And if this story is true, if this is actually true and what happened to him, my heart, my empathy to this little boy who went through hell and back in his life, you know, just because of who his parents were. So, now, France at this time went by a particular law, a lot of a lot of countries did, where the crown could only be inherited by males. So obviously Louis Charles was more of a threat to the revolutionaries than Maria Theresa, because she was a daughter. Now that doesn't mean like if Maria Theresa had had a son, her son would then go on to be potentially be in line for the throne. But in the in the immediate moment, the daughter was not as concerning as the little eight-year-old son. Now, we do know that Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth, their parents, did meet the guillotine. Um, it, 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 we talked about last week how everyone was shocked that a king and a queen had been beheaded. And I'm like, y'all, it's happened before. If we're looking at the official narrative, check out Oliver Cromwell in the English Civil War and Charles. It's happened before. So the fact that they are shocked this could happen to a king and a queen shows you that these even, even back then, humans did not realize that history does repeat itself. That's something we need to learn is that history does repeat itself. That's another reason why we study history so it won't repeat itself. So Marie, Antw Marie Antoinette and Louis the 16th are unalived. And so now we've got these two kids and in fairness to the French people, they didn't necessarily hurt the children. Like they, they imprisoned them in very awful environments, which is not good, but they didn't physically hurt the children, which I can say, you know, for as much brutality that was happening at that time, that's, you know, I think there was some, some tiny bit of compassion that these were babies. These were children. So Maria, Maria Teresa was exiled. She ended up marrying, later on married her cousin, her first cousin, who was her father's brother's son. Ugh, that's gross. And he ended up becoming Louis the 18th um, after Napoleon, but that's a story for a different day. But her brother, Louis Charles, as the story goes, he was eventually sent to live with a, a family where he basically had the royalist in him like beaten out of him and he ended up dying of a sickness. So he didn't make it past, according to the official narr narrative, he did not pay make it past childhood. But what this this story says is that because Louis Charles was the next in line for the throne, the people who were loyal to the monarchy, the House of Bourbon of France, basically devised a plan to get to extract Louis Charles from the prison. Now, once Louis the Sixteenth was dead, that automatically made it made Louis Charles Louis the Seventeenth. So that's why his brother became Louis the Eighteenth. It looks like we're missing. We're skipping a number. No, it's because immediately he became Louis the Seventeenth. Now, according to this research, what they did because the daughter cannot sit on the throne, they have to extract the son. These are people who are loyal to the monarchy. They want to put the monarchy back on the throne of France. So, a handful of people we're talking about worked with some of the prison guards, a, a man and wife, to get the kid out. So, what they did is they went and found a cousin of Louis Charles, who resembled him, who was already sickly. Like 
that's kind of barbaric, right? Like they were like, this kid's going to pass away anyway. They're around the same age. Let's use this to our advantage. And so while in prison, Louis Charles was granted some toys. One of these toys is a good old fashioned rocking horse. I think we've all had rocking horses for, for hundreds of years. Now I had a rocking horse and Barbies, you know? And so what they did is they got this rocking horse and they put the sick cousin inside, they drugged him and put him inside the rocking horse to get the rocking horse shipped into the prison. Once it got into the cell, Louis Charles, Charles's cell, they got the cousin out and they switched their clothes. So they put the royal clothes on the cousin and they put peasant clothes on Louis Charles. They put Louis Charles into a laundry basket, put dirty clothes on top of it so that the laundry could be taken out with the lawn, lawn, laundress, with the woman doing the laundry, which who was in on this extraction. And I laugh. This is like the story of Annie. If you know the story of Annie, she goes out in a, in a laundry basket too. So good thing to know if you need to escape a prison, just get in the laundry basket. <laughs> and so he's taken out of, out, he's brought to um, allies of, of the monarchy where he then is thrown with one of these allies where he has to go to like, these wars in Egypt, which, I mean, as I'm saying, bless this kid's heart. I mean, the trauma that this child went through is not lost on me. As Napoleon is starting his wars all over Europe, there is speculation now at this point that Louis Charles might have escaped. Now, meanwhile, the cousin who's pretending to be Louis Charles has passed away. And so people think that he is gone. Now, Stephen does put in his book, in his research, that many years ago, the boy who was given the grave of Louis Charles was was taken out. They, 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 they did exhume him and they tested his DNA and his DNA does match the mitochondrial DNA of Marie Antoinette. However, that doesn't really mean anything because the cousin would have also had that same mitochondrial DNA because it was coming through the mother's line. So all that proved is that the body that was in this grave was a Habsburg, was related to the Habsburg family. Doesn't prove it was Louis Charles and certainly doesn't prove that it, or disprove that it was the cousin. It, it basically, it could have been both of them. So, you know, we kind of hit a dead end with DNA, DNA testing on that particular body. So the legend again goes that Napoleon has become aware that Louis Charles is alive and that the child that was buried as Louis Charles was not Louis Charles. And this is concerning to Napoleon because if, if one of the heirs to the throne of France is found out to be alive, there could be way more of a pushback against Napoleon because they have now, they have someone that according to their laws of divine right should be ruling France. So at that point, in the meantime, let me back up a little bit. In the meantime, the guy who's like attending to him and guarding him has passed away. And this guy was quite wealthy. And so he left Louis Charles with a good bit of money, about a million dollars in today's in today's world, you know. And so Louis Charles, who's still like a teenager, is has this money now. And now Napoleon knows he's around. And so his his protectors contact King George, Mad King George, who was the king. Uh, that the Americans fought against in the American Revolution and his wife, Queen Charlotte. Queen Charlotte herself was related to Marie Antoinette. She was a cousin of the Habsburgs. And so they reach out to this monarchy and they say, hey, we have Louis Charles. He needs protection. Can we bring him to you? And so Queen Charlotte takes in her cousin's child and brings him into to the court in England for his own protection. In the meantime, we have this Pastor family, and it goes into detail about what that name means, because we know in, in, in olden times, our surnames became um, significant over what our parents or our, our ancestors did. And basically, from what I understand, the name Pastor kind of basically means like an accountant. He, this guy was the guy that was paying the bills for for the king he was responsible for keeping keeping up with the books and giving the you know paying people what what they were owed for their services to the monarchy and this particular family had been in service in the royal court of france and now was in the royal court of england and so they charlotte and king george decide does devise a plan because it's also you know the american revolution has just been fought and america did something the colonists did something that nobody expected and they basically kicked 
a monarchy's ass and won their independence. And so there's also this underlying tension amongst all these houses, these royal houses in Europe about this. And obviously that played out in France, right? We saw the downfall of the House of Bourbon. So you would have to be an idiot to not be a little bit paranoid if you were in any of these monarchies, knowing that this has now happened twice, okay? So they've taken this family member in and now they're going to devise a plan. And so they talk to the Pesor patriarch and they say, can you adopt this little kid as your son and take him to America? So they agree. And Louis Charles at that point changes, according to the story, changes his name to Daniel Pesor. Now I found this hysterical and he actually does have like records of this. So regardless of whether the P family is notoriously pulling the strings behind the curtain or not, we do know that King George got them land in what is the state of North Carolina. Now at this point, America had won its independence. So King George couldn't really give land to anybody because it wasn't his land to give anymore. So what he did, and I found this so hysterical because there's just some things about us that will never change. I mean, you guys, I want to know in the comment section, how many times as a child did you forge your parents' signature? Because this is basically what King George did. So basically after the American Root Revolution had been won, part of the agreement with land was that anybody who had been granted land by the crown before the American Revolution would still hold on to their land. They were going to be grandfathered in. It was totally fine. So what King George did is he wrote a note in his father's handwriting and backdated it to make it look like his father had given this land to this family many, many decades before the American Revolution so that the American government would have to honor it and give this family this land in North Carolina. Now, the funny thing is, is King George wrote the county and the date in which this letter is written, that county didn't exist. So we know it's a forgery. But nonetheless, it worked. According to legend, they ended up in North Carolina where they settled and where they started growing their family. The, the descendants of Daniel became the puppet masters of the world of the world. You know, in the in the first part, they talk about the scuffle between France and Spain and borders and how the Peso family came to be. That doesn't matter to me because we all come from everywhere and, you know, we're looking at the House of Bourbon, really. Just because he's taken another name doesn't mean that he originates from that name, right? He is the House of Bourbon if this story is to be believed. And so today we're going to be talking about, again, Peter Stuart Ney, who is another... I, I, this is the one I'd never heard of before, and I was like, you've got to be shitting me when I was reading this. I was like, this is... As Mark Twain said, it wrote, the truth is stranger than fiction. This is a wild story on its own. We're either looking at a huge cover-up, another fake death, or we're looking at schizophrenia in like the 1800s. Okay, delusional disorder. So now let's, let's move forward. We understand how we got here, like how Daniel ended up in North Carolina. We know how, how they got here from France. He was supposed to be put back on the throne. That didn't happen because of Napoleon. So he gets moved to America under a fake name. Meanwhile, as stuff's happening between Napoleon and the royal family, his uncle Louis XVIII comes onto the throne. Again, that's a different history, but we're going to focus now on Daniel. His role was to eventually go back on the throne of France. That didn't happen. So he's now an American living in America in a, in a colony that was English. So there's a lot of English culture. However, just because it's an English colony, there's a crap ton of French people here too. So he does he does blend in with his accent, with everything. Of course, at this point, the child probably does speak English because he's been shuffled around living in the English court, but he probably still has a slight French accent. French, French accent, if I had to guess. Children typically lose their accents. Like if you move a 10-year-old from England to America and they spend the rest of their life in America, their accent is going to change. That's this, The same can't really be said about adults, but... I imagine he still had a hint of a French accent. Again, not weird for this area. Not weird, not weird. All right, so now let's pick up with Peter Stewart Ney. All right. A ship pulls into the Charleston Harbor in January of 1816. That's where my family's from. I think at this point, though, it was still Charlestown. It eventually became Charleston. And again, Charleston, South Carolina, a lot of French people. So the fact that this ship coming from France is docking into the Charleston Harbor not weird at all. Not weird at all. Disembarking from the ship was a tall, thin man, man who identified himself as Peter Stuart Ney. 
He didn't stay in Charleston very long. Several people there approached him and asked if he was Napoleon's top general, Marshal Michel Ney. He vigorously denied it and soon left Charleston for good. So Charleston, South Carolina is a state that's directly south of North Carolina. Okay. I'm originally from South Carolina. He became a teacher and for a short time, he, he, he ugh, let me start that again. He became a teacher and for a short time taught at an academy in Lincoln County, North Carolina, near present day Denver, North Carolina. He eventually moved to Rowan County, North Carolina and remained the remainder of his life there. This is the area where the Pesor family also lives. Okay. There is no doubt that Peter Stewart Ney was a French man. The accent was unmistakable. He was also regal and bearing and was an expert at fencing by all accounts. So who was Peter Stewart Ney and what is his significance to this story? Many people believe that he was actually, again, Marshal Michel Ney, Napoleon's general. However, the historic documents state that, that Michel Ney was executed by in France in December 18. 15. In December of 1850, Marshal Michel Ney was led to the Luxembourg Palace Gardens to face his unaliving. I won't say it again. This in itself was unusual as the normal means of unaliving in France at the time was the guillotine. The location of the unaliving was also unusual. At the last minute, the location had been changed to the Palace Gardens. This meant that there would be very few spectators, as most had now gone to the previous announced location. So there's some shenanigans happening with how they're going to unalive him. It's There's some confusion, and it's not the typical, although I would rather be unalived this way than the guillotine. The guillotine scares me. Nay, wearing a dark suit, walked into the garden. He wore no restraints and was not tied or chained. He walked to the wall, turned to face the squad. That's all I'll say. I'm careful about what I say here. Stepped three paces forward, stopped and raised his hand. To command, uh, the command to the present arms is given. And Ney returns to salute the man. He then walked over to the presiding officer, Major de Saint Baez, and spoke briefly with him. Major de Saint Baez gave command, ready, aim. And the command to fire was from Ney himself, bringing his hand down sharply to his chest. I don't know how that's done. If you, if you are in the military and you know, you can like tell us how this would have looked, let me know. I'm, I've never been in the military, so, and I don't know if they even do this anymore, but let us know. When the or order to was given from 12 rung out, only 30 feet from where Marshall Ney stood. And for those who are new to the internet world, YouTube has very strict, I didn't mention this at the beginning, very strict terms and services about certain words we can say. And unfortunately, a lot of these words regarding people being unalived are in here. So I, I think you guys know what I mean when I do this. All right. Ney had fallen forward. The official report to King Louis XVIII, so Louis Charles's, Louis Charles's paternal uncle, his father's brother, stated that 12 musket had struck Ney, unaliving him instantly. Being hit with 12 from 30 feet or less would have propelled him backwards, not forward. Marshal Ney's body was placed on a stretcher, covered and removed from the garden. The body remained in the hospital until 6 o'clock the next morning when it was removed and buried in a secret location. Another mystery during this entire time, during the unaliving and the body's response in the hospital, his wife of 13 years never came by. By all accounts, she loved Marshal Michel Ney very much, but she never saw him after he was unalived. Questions began to arise as to whether Marshal Ney was actually unalived. For 200 years, these questions have bothered many historians. But maybe there is an answer to these questions. So this is not just, this is what I found fascinating. We're going to get more into this, into my own research, into this dude. This is not just like some silly little local urban legend here in the South. This is like a mystery to historians. Like, wow, this is crazy. So why was Ney unalived in the first place? When Napoleon began his conquest of most of Europe, 
Ney was one of his top generals. In fact, Napoleon had once remarked that Marshal Michel Ney was the bravest of the brave. When Napoleon was defeated, and I always get the ABBA song stuck in my head, Waterloo, because, I mean, that's how we learn history, right? If, if you don't know where Napoleon was defeated, there is a song by ABBA called Waterloo. You will never forget where Napoleon was defeated after you, if you're, if you're young and you've blessed your heart, if you're young and you've never heard the song. It's a great song. It's how ABBA got famous. But yeah, Waterloo was where he was defeated. When Napoleon was defeated and exiled to the island of Elba, King Louis XVIII thought, though he didn't completely trust them, and treated Napoleon's former generals to support the monarchy. As Louis XVI's brother... Louis XVIII had assumed the throne, the rightful heir, his, since his brother... Brother's son, Louis Charles, Daniel Pesor, was presumed unalive. As you remember, by this time, the crown prince, Louis Charles, had secretly fled to America with the royal waymaster, George Pesor. Louis Charles had changed his name to Daniel, and with assistance from England's George III, had settled on a 600-acre land grant in North Carolina. Napoleon's exile in Elba lasted only about a year when he invaded the south of France with a small army determined to once again become the emperor. He took Grenoble without... So he didn't even have to. He, just the fact that he was coming, people surrendered, right? So he didn't even have to use one of these. Like, people just surrendered. All the soldiers at Grenoble refused to fight and changed sides supporting Napoleon. <laughs> That's how terrifying he was. This turn of events worried Louis the this turn of events worried Louis XVIII, that's a typo there, though he didn't entirely trust Napoleon's marshals that he had inherited and had no choice but to assemble them in the army and try to stop Napoleon's advances towards Paris. When Marshal Ney was summoned to the royal court, he promised the king to return, to return Napoleon to Paris in an iron cage. Ney and his army went, were sent to engage Napoleon. When the two armies met, they stood in silence, facing each other for a long time. The silence was finally broken when Napoleon rode to the front. How awkward is this, is this, you guys? I'm sorry. This is super uncomfortable. Like, I, this is so awkward. <laughs> I mean, I know all is fair in love and war, but this is really awkward. So, like, Marshal Ney used to be one of Napoleon's really good, like, one of his besties. He was a great marshal. He then switched sides, and now he's facing off, like, super awkward. And he's got all his men, and they're just kind of staring at each other, like, old friends but now they're foes like super awkward you guys it's like exes like exes having to be at a dinner party together this is so awkward so <laughs> let's read that again nay and his army were sent to engage napoleon when the two armies met they stood in silence facing each other for a long time the silence was finally broken when napoleon rode to the front at that time a cry went out from nay's army they shouted viva la em emperor broke reins and joined napoleon's army <laughs> Ney rode forward and greeted the former emperor. Napoleon asked Ney to join his call to Ney agreed. So Ney was like, basically like, okay, this is so awkward. I'm just going to come back and join you. Like talk about a fair weathered friend, right? Going back and forth. We all know those people, don't we? We all know those people that no matter who, who has the, ever has the most power, they're going to have those little flying monkeys around them. They're going to switch sides. Like, I mean, granted, in fairness, this is a war. So I think a lot of us would probably do this just to save our own lives. But anyway, story for a different day. This entire force began their advance towards Paris. Upon he hearing what happened, Louis XVIII fled to the safety of Belgium. Napoleon was back in charge. It stayed this way until Napoleon suffered his final defeat by Wellington at Waterloo. There we go. Less than 100 days later. So the following is taken from an article by Thomas Gregory. Peter Stuart Ney, Freemason, Marshal of Napoleon. With the king back in power... A list of traitors was drawn up. Near the top of that list was the name Marshal Michel Ney. The Chamber of, of Peers found Ney guilty of treason and ordered his unaliving. At the trial, Ney spoke, Yes, I am, a, I am French. I will die French. In his book, Marshal Ney, A Dual Life, Leggett Blythe states that Wellington had intervened. His being a Freemason, a member of a lodge and county meet in Ireland. Dr. Edward Smoot, author of Marshal Ney Before and After, Unaliving, 
states, I believe that Wellington saved Nay's life and in all probability did not wish to intervene publicly. A mock unaliving would serve its purpose. Everything considered and Nay at the same time would be sufficiently punished. King Louis decided to send the man he trusted most, Charles Talleyrand Pergor, to Vienna for the peace conference while at home the arrest and trials began in earnest. So, Charles served as an, amb an ambassador and a minister of foreign affairs. He helped, he, helped, he helped form the provisional government, but by late 1815 was forced to resign due to the hostility of the Bourbon nobility. So Bourbon, that's, that's the family. That's the, the Louis, right? They're the Bourbons. So Charles was a Freemason, a member of the Nine Sisters Lodge in Paris. The same lodge as many of Napoleon's generals, including Marshal Michel Ney. So Charles, the French guy, and Wellington had met on so many occasions and were cordial friends through the Freemasons. So Charles had much to do before heading to, to Vienna. Growing concern for Napoleon's officers and their families prompted a secret mission where he visited England to secure cordial relations between two former enemies. So the French guy, Charles, did all he could to secure cooperation and the escaped and subsequent safe passage for the French officers to Quebec, Britain's French-speaking province in North America. So Quebec. He was unsuccessful as the king, George, refused any official participation in such a plan. Another way would have been found to save Marshall and others. So they were trying to send him to the French territory of quebec which was under british control as canada is still under british control so that was the first plan but obviously that's not going to happen so we're on to plan b with it because you know a french uh freemasons will be very loyal to each other and will save each other's asses right within a few days of returning to france from britain the french guy charles boarded a ship for america while in philadelphia he visited the grave of Benjamin Franklin to pay his respects. I've been to that grave many times. It's just a grave. You can throw pennies on it, make a wish, whatever. The time has finally come for repayment of debt involving Franklin's fellow Masons of St. John's Lodge in Philadelphia. So he's going to find other Freemasons to help out. During Franklin's nine-year stay in France at Benjamin Franklin, so at, at the first U.S. as the so let's, let's start that again. So we're talking about Benjamin Franklin now, one of the main founding fathers of the United States. A lot of speculation on whether this guy was actually good or not. That's a story for a different day, though. What we do know, we do know Benjamin Franklin was indeed a Freemason, as they all are. During Franklin's nine-year stay in France, as the first U.S. ambassador to France, he became very popular with the French people. He was active in the Nine Sisters Lodge, so the same lodge where Marshal Ney was also a member where arrangements had been worked out in private for military assistance during the War of Independence. All right, so this is going to get us into, in a couple weeks, into the Marquis de Lafayette. So I said this last week. For the French people watching, I know I've got some really killer cool French people watching me, do not let the controllers divide us because the colonists, my ancestors, here in the United States that were patriots who fought in the American Revolution, some of them were obviously were also of French descent. And you guys, your ancestors, were thick as thieves. The French people and the American colonists, they did it all together, right? France sent people over to help the Americans fight in the French Revolution, right? So the fact that Benjamin Franklin was liked by the French people is not shocking to me. I know they're trying the propaganda to divide Americans from Fran the French people, but like historically... Yo, we, we're like besties. Like, we've literally, we're like a gang. <laughs> we've literally helped each other out, and we've literally supported each other. And my heart to my French people watching, I support you guys, and I want you guys to be independent. I want everybody in the world to be independent. I think I think most of us now know that it was never our country. It, wasn't, it was never the people of the countries against each other, right? As I said earlier, a lot of French people came to the English colony in the southeast for protection. To, because the English people were Protestants. And you know who protected all the French people and were welcoming them? English people. Brought them in, protected them, because they wanted the same moralistic religion that they did. So the people of this world, we all like each other. We all will protect each other. 
We want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We want everybody to be free. It's the establishment. It's the establishment that has pinned us against each other. And now we're starting to see that, aren't we? It's never us versus us. It's always us versus them, the establishment, okay? So this is not shocking to me with Benjamin Franklin being so popular in France and why a lot of like the Marquis de Lafayette, like a lot of the French people who helped us in the American Revolution were popular here in America. All right. So let so and again, so Benjamin Franklin is highly loved in France. He's a famous guy at this point. He's a politician here in America. He's one of our founding fathers. He is now the first U.S. ambassador in France. He's also a part of the lodge the Masonic Lodge that Ney is a part of in France. So they know each other. He's also using this time for support. Like he's getting more and more support. We're going to have the War of 1812 as well in the United States, which was like a second little, little tiny American revolution. It's where our national anthem comes from. So this is all making sense historically and the way that people perceived each other culturally back in this time. So let me read this again, okay? During Franklin's nine-year stay in France as the first U.S. ambassador to France, he became very popular with the French people. He was active in the Nine Sisters Lodge, where agreements had been worked out in pri for private military assistance during the War of Independence. The Masonic kindness experienced by Franklin many years before would now be reciprocated in Philadelphia. So, you scratched my back when I was in France. I'll scratch your back here. And so, with the assistance of the St. John's Lodge members... Numerous French military officers would be helped to enter the United States at Baltimore and Philadelphia. These are harbors. That, well, we know the Baltimore Harbor, right? That was just on the news a few months back. These are harbors that are pretty close to each other on the East Coast. Then they would disappear into the countryside, most likely in French-speaking areas of South Carolina. There we go. And Louisiana. So there we go. South Carolina, French-speaking areas. So what significance, what is significant of Peter Ney being Marshall Ney and traveling to live in a particular area of North Carolina? Taken by itself, there would be no real significance. It would simply be an, a, a coincidental occurrence. However, there are several things that appear to be more than just a coincidence. It may be suggested that Marshall Ney wanted to live anonymously for the rest of his life and choose this royal area in order to not attract undue attention. And if attention had been drawn to him, the remoteness of the area would significantly hinder word of his presence from being from leaking out. But why this particular area? Were there not equally remote places in the United States that would serve him just as well? Of course there were. And for anybody who's looking at a map right now of North Carolina and you think, how is this remote? It's so close to the coast. So the coast is just a very small part. You got Appalachia. Like you go, you go a few miles inland and you got Appalachia, right? So this is where this is taking place. We've talked a lot about Appalachia, especially on my series on Gnostic TV, on the Esoteric Explorer series. Appalachia is still in 2024, hard to to navigate. So people still to this day, still to this day, people go to Appalachia to get off the grid and to hide. All right. Ney moved to this area to keep an eye on Daniel Pesor, to be available to assist or summon aid if needed. Regardless of which side Ney had served in France, he was still a Frenchman and was loyal to his homeland. Before his secret exile, he owned a small farm in the Lorraine area of France, which was now under Prussian-German rule. As you remember, the French Lorraine area bordered the German Palatine. Both provinces had large German and French-speaking populations due to immigration back and forth. Another coincidence. So he could have his family could have known the Pesors is basically what he's saying. There could have been an even deeper connection, not just having to do with the Bourbon house, with Louis Charles, but with the actual family that he was adopted into. So what evidence do we have that Peter Stuart Ney was actually Marshal Michel Ney, general to Napoleon? Actually, we do have some evidence, though it is mostly circumstantial. For many accounts, Peter Ney's body had many scars that seemed to be from... Once a, a fencing master visited the school that Nay taught in Rowan County, North Carolina, the students convinced Nay to spar with this master. Nay was quite a bit older than the traveling fencing master, yet he disarmed him in a very short order. The fencing master left the area telling the students they had already that they already had a fencing master. Nay had confessed to Reverend Basil Jones of South Carolina that he was in fact Marshall Nay. He said that the had arranged for him to fake his death, that he had placed a bladder of blood under his coat, the was loaded with blanks. When he fell, he burst the bladder and let the blood flow out upon the ground. 
Nay enjoyed arriving at the school where he taught early in the mornings to read the newspaper. As he was reading one morning in 1821, he saw the article which told of Napoleon's death. Nay seemed to be obviously upset. He canceled the classes for that day and returned to the boarding house where he lived. Later that day, he tried to unalive himself by doing this with his throat. He would have passed on had not other residents of the boarding house found him. He eventually recovered. The Reverend James A. Winston, rector of the Protestant Episcopal Church of the Ascension in History, uh, Hickory, North Carolina, published a book in the early 1900s entitled Historic Doubts as the of Marshall Ney. In the book, Reverend Weston recounted a conversation that he had had with Marshall Michelle Ney's son. The son stated that the day after Marshall's, he visited with his wife and children at their house in France. So a ghost came to visit. The son went on to say that when he arrived in America in 1837, he called on Peter Ney in North Carolina. So then the son eventually came, called on Peter Ney because he thought it was his dad. Peter Ney, Ney gave the son $1,000, which he used to pay for his medical education at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. The son became a doctor and resided in, actually, I think that's where my great-grandfather went to medical school. <laughs> my great-grandfather from South Carolina, I think he went to medical school at Jefferson Medical College. I'll have to check on that, though. The son became a doctor and resided in Kentucky and practiced medicine there. He was interviewed when he was 88 years old and confirmed much of what had been written about Marshall Ney and his escape to America. Peter Ney told a friend, John Rogers, that he had always hoped to return to France, but those hopes had vanished now that Napoleon had died. Marshall Ney was a Freemason, a very high rank Rosicrucian, and a member of the Knights Templar. Peter Ney always seemed to live in areas where there was active Freemason community. Many believe that one or more of these organizations aided in his escape from the and his escape to America. There are two significant quotes attributed to Peter Ney. He reportedly said as he was leaving the earth, Rosary is dead and the old guard is defeated. Now let me die. The second, again on his deathbed, his doctor asked Point Blake if Marshall, if he was Marshall Ney. Ney rep replied, by all that is holy, I am Marshall Ney of France. Peter Stewart Ney left this earth in Rowan County, North Carolina, and is buried at the Third Creek Presbyterian Church near Cleveland, North Carolina. The inscription on his tombstone reads, in memory of Peter, Peter Stuart Ney, a native of France and a soldier of the French Revolution under Napoleon Bonaparte, who departed this life on November 15th, 1846, aged 77 years old. Now, I'm going to go through some of my research into Peter Stuart Ney. And there's been some very interesting developments as of late as to who this guy really was. As it said earlier, historians, people around the world have questioned whether he was actually Michelle Ney. Now, again, back in this time, it would have been a whole lot easier to fake your unaliving as it is now. But nonetheless, before we get into my research, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our new sponsors, Miramate. I love, I love these pads. You can lay on them. They're a sister company to Spooky 2. With both Mirror Mate and Spooky 2, which is a Rife machine, you can get 5% off any purchase you make by using my name, Bryce Watson, B-R-I-C-E, W-A-T-S-O-N, at checkout. That's your discount code, again, for 5% off. So just hold on one second as we get into our new sponsor. Before we continue with the story today, I want to give a brief shout out to one of our sponsors, Miramate. Miramate is a sister company to Spooky2. And let's go ahead and just take a gander at the website for a moment because I am so excited about this product. Actually, there are so many products on this website, you guys. It is a PMF mat. So this is along the lines of Spooky2 where it's working with frequency, Tesla technology, to heal you basically. Of course, a lot of people are familiar with the big mats that you can lay on that it works on your whole body, but there's also like a mini magic mat as well that you can sit on. There's the uh, UVA therapy. Um, we also have these things, these Amira Mate mini magic. You can take, you guys, you can take this on a run with you. You just clip it to your outfit or hiking and it helps keep your body from basically falling apart while you are doing what you love to do. Analog PMF therapy. 
involves the use of devices that emit low frequency electromagnetic waves. These waves are designed to penetrate the body and stimulate cellular functions. Unlike digital PMF devices, which generate pulse signals using digital electronics, analog PMF devices produce continuous and smooth waveforms closely resembling the natural magnetic fields found in the environment. This can help with sleep problems, pain and, infl pain and inflammation, mood issues, fatigue and lethargy, and difficulty concentrating. You guys, there are so many products. I swear to God, I, I just did a video. I just filmed a video with Brad. You guys know Brad. He's with Spooky 2 and with Mirror Mate. And I could not get over the amount of products that this company actually has. They have videos, obviously, of customer reviews. So if you want to go on the website, which we listed down below, you can look at all of the customer reviews. I mean, their shop guys, they have PMF machines, the light devices, light cold laser devices. They have um, products for fertility. They have a specific product under um, under their cold laser devices that are specifically for your period for women. They have stuff for men's prostates. This is an incredible. I cannot wait to use this product myself. I, I am so 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 excited. Now, as always, with this product as well as Spooky Two, if you place my name. Bryce Watson, B-R-I-C-E-W-A-T-S-O-N, at discount, discount code, you will get 5% off of your purchase, just like with Spooky 2. So as always, everything will be down in the description box below. As Mira May, just like Spooky 2, has incredible customer services. They are really an incredible company. They've treated me very, very, very well. I know from some of you who've reached out to me, you tell me that they actually were so good to you as well. And they helped explain things to you and helped work you through using the product. So if this is something you're interested in, I would absolutely encourage you to try this product, get in touch with Brad and go ahead and explore the website. There's so many options, different price points of things you can do. And it's an excellent way to get your help back. All right, you guys, let's get back to the scandalous and juicy deep dive. All right, you guys, let's talk about Peter Stewart Nay. So again, I took Stephen Pesor's research on Peter Stewart Nay, and I dug a little deeper. Now, a few years ago, a French documentary, docu documentary company, a media company from, again, from France, literally from France, came to North Carolina. This is a very rural area. I'm actually pretty close to his grave. At some point, I think I'll probably travel up there. And his grave has definitely been like marked very significantly. I think they've had some vandalism uh, as this folklore and legend has grown. I, I think that the county has had to actually do things to protect um, the grave. But this French um, company brought in sci forensic scientists who, who exhumed the body of Peter Stewart Nay, and they did do some DNA testing to see who this guy really was. Now, when I first was looking into this, the DNA they tested was of a man who genetically matched most of the people who colonized that area, meaning his DNA was more closely related to that of an English person. And when I first saw this, I was like, well, that that explains it. Like he was not Marshall Michelle, Michelle Ney. But then I started thinking about it. And I started really thinking about this research. And I was like, but does that really prove it? Think about it this way, you guys. I identify as an American. I have, my family's been here for many generations. I'm a proud, I'm proud of my country. I, this is my home. This is where I'm the most comfortable. But my, my DNA shows Europe. And I love going to Europe. I love visiting, but this is my home. I'm an American. I have an American accent. I'm an American. So, if, if someone were to find my body like a thousand years or not even that 200 years from now, let's say somebody finds my body 200 years from now and they don't know much about the, let's just say for some reason, they don't know much about the settlement of the Europeans in America and they test my DNA. They're going to think I'm not from that area. Right. But I am. Can the same not be true for Europe? White people live in Europe. And yes, there are different flavors of white people. Absolutely. Genetically, wherever you live, you survival of the fittest, your DNA is going to shift a little bit to, to accommodate the demands of nature. Could it not be possible that Michel Ney, genetically, even though he was a Frenchman through his mother's line or whatever, maybe genetically he had a lot of English DNA, 
right? Like, like my sister married, my, my brother-in-law is half Italian. Like his mom is straight up from Italy. And so when my sister, who is very Anglican, like I am, and my brother-in-law started having kids, we were certain that all of her kids would come out looking very Italian. Only one of her kids, she has four kids. Only one of them looks super Italian. The rest look very Anglican like we do. And one of my, my nephew had his DNA tested and he only came back 3% Italian, but his dad's half Italian. So sometimes we, when, when we, are, we have all, we have all this DNA, we have all these genetics to pick from thousands of years worth of genetics. And we have all these different, and some are, some are going to be more dominant than others. Am I making sense? So does this really prove that this is not Michelle Ney? Could Michelle Ney not have had some English heritage, even though he was a Frenchman, a proud Frenchman? Again, I'm a proud American. And I've got heavy English descent, heavy French descent, heavy, Ger heavy German descent, but I'm an effing American. This is my country I'm loyal to. I'm loyal to America. This is my country. Doesn't matter what my genetics say, this is my country. So can the same not be said for Marshall Michelle Nay? Now, I don't know, this is speculation. This is just speculation. But playing devil's advocate, if this wasn't Marshall Michelle Nay, or just Michelle Nay, Marshall was his job title, was this somebody with a delusional disorder? Was this perhaps somebody who was so obsessed with Napoleon that he took on the persona of this person who had been unalived because of schizophrenia or whatever mental disorder? Maybe he learned how to fake a French accent. I don't know. Is it some other story that we don't even know that the Freemasons are behind? And at the end of the day, whether this was Marshall Michelle Ney or some guy with a delusional order, de delusional disorder, or something else entirely, who did he hurt? If he was here to guard Daniel Pesor, well, we've got some other people coming up that allegedly were all supposed to supposed to guard, to guard him, but yet we don't see. We know they're in the same area, but we don't see much interaction. Was he just a handler? I've got more questions about this. And I'm going to encourage you guys to look deeper into this as well. Like, we think nowadays that this grand conspiracy of all these people faking their deaths is a new thing. No, it seems this has been going on for a while. Doesn't mean it's true. This guy very, very well could have been a schizophrenic. We just didn't have the words for it back then. Doesn't mean he's not stupid. Could have been very smart. Doesn't, I mean, doesn't mean he is stupid. He could, have, he could have been very smart. He was a teacher. He could have been very smart. But he could have also had a delusional disorder. A mental sickness. Is it just a coincidence if he was delusional that there were lots of lodges? There are lodges literally everywhere. Be careful about how you write that down in the comment section, guys, just to be weary of the powers that be. There are lodges everywhere, though. Like, everywhere. So, couldn't you say that about anyone that they're living near a lodge? I mean, I'm living, I mean, there's a lodge down the street, and I'm not affiliated with that. Like, they're everywhere. What does that have to do? What does one have to do with the other? Unless the story with Benjamin Franklin is correct, but could that also be junk conspiracy? Could that be embellishment? It happened a very long time ago. And my big question, I saved this for the end. Why not just exhume Marshall Michelle Ney? Seems like we would solve a lot of problems if we just went to France and exhumed his body. Why does it all rest on Peter Stuart Ney? Unless the powers that be know something about the burial site in France that they don't want the rest of us to know. This is purely speculation, guys. I am open to any possibility. I am not invested in this guy being who he says he was or a crazy dude or I'm not invested in any of this. I'm just looking at all possibilities. And so now, with that being said, I thought that chapter was pretty thin and we would go on to Jean Lafayette. But again, as I started doing my own research, I was like, oh, hell no. We gotta, we gotta stop and pause on this for a moment. And I am gonna encourage you guys Please go research this. If you're from France, let me know. Let me know. Send me pictures of Marshall Michel Ney's burial site. Let me know what you've heard. Because obviously this isn't just a, a United States conspiracy. It's if the French people came over here and hired forensic people 
to uh, dig him up. This is obviously a very concerning conspiracy that's bigger than just the United States and is bigger than just France. This is something that's like, whoa, whoa. So anyway, let me know what you guys think down below. Um, I'm so excited to get into Jean Lafayette because I love all the, the pirate stories that we have here in the Southeast. And it's a way for, for me to talk about my own culture, where I come from, in case you guys ever want to visit us down here in the South. I've lived all over this world. I've lived in so many different countries. I've traveled all four corners of the world. And I always say I'm so glad that I was born in the Southeastern United States. Being from the South is one of the biggest gifts that I have been given in this world because it is literally the most eccentric place that you will ever be from. We got people walking ghost dogs everywhere. We've got hauntings everywhere. We we got pirate stories, voodoo, hoodoo, everything, you name it. We got feral people in Appalachia, Bigfoot, all sorts of stuff. And so I'm so excited to get into the fo folklore behind Jean Lafayette and see where this pirate story collides with Daniel Pesor. All right, you guys, that's for next week. Again, a link to this book will be down in the description box below if you want it. Otherwise, I'm reading through it myself, and you can just take the this and do your own research in the Google machine or the DuckDuckGo machine. Otherwise, the book is there. And yeah, cannot wait to hear what you guys think down in the description box, or excuse me, the comment section below. All of our sponsors, everything else is in the description box. And I will talk to y'all soon. Bye, everybody.